everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of In the Studio. I'm Lynn Weaver, and our topic today is Who is my dad? We will be discussing artificial insemination and uh, the um, who benefits from it, and also uh, some of the uh, psychological and social aspects of uh, this type of uh, uh, conception. Uh, we will also be uh, talking about a 10-year study uh, and the found findings for this study uh, that basically says that uh, about, about one-third of uh, uh, children uh, created or born in this way would like to know the identity of uh, their donor. I have invited with me a distinguished guest, uh, uh, Joanna Sheb. She is an associate and adjunct professor of psychology at UC Davis, and uh, she also is a research director or the research director of the Sperm Bank of California, and her research centers on uh, uh, all the aspect, family and uh, uh, donors, as well as children's um, uh, in, uh, in an artificial uh, insemination uh, realm. Um, thank you so much. Welcome, Joanna. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to talk with, with us. Now, um, in non-technical terms, <laughs> What is artificial insemination? It has various names, mm -hmm. but this is the, the name that is mostly familiar to yeah, us. Yeah, artificial insemination is the um, name that the, the term that they use often in the medical literature. It actually includes um, not just donors, sperm donors, but also uh, a woman's partner. So when the focus is on the donors, uh, the involvement of a sperm donor, typically an anonymous sperm donor, the term that they use is uh, donor insemination or assisted conception. Again, assisted conception is a broad term. Yes. So donor insemination is actually, even though it's part of the reproductive technologies, and we always think of those as being really a modern thing, um, donor insemination with anonymous donors has been around for over 100 years. Um, the first medical reference to it was in uh, the late 1800s with a doctor um, using the sperm of an unknown donor um, to assist a heterosexual couple to conceive a child. Um, in that case, um, it, the woman actually didn't know that a donor was used. Oh. Um, and of course, there's biblical references to um, assisted uh, uh, conception that go back even further. But if we limit it to the medical literature, um, that's the first documented case. Um, up until the 1980s, um, the way that donor insemination was done and used, if, if a sperm donor was assisting in the, in the conception, um, this was an anonymous donor, mm -hmm. so he would not ever, hypothetically, be known mm -hmm. to the um, the couple, typically heterosexual couple, who would be uh, conceiving with the assistance of a sperm. Um, in the 1980s, uh, two major things happened. Uh, in Sweden, in 1984, legislation passed which banned anonymous donations. So sperm donors could no longer be anonymous. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they, had to be, they had to be identifiable, but what that meant was identifiable to... Um, Adults, so they had to be either 16 or 18, mm -hmm. um, basically maturity and maturity. Mm -hmm. And if the donor conceived person was interested in uh, learning the identity of their sperm donor, they could go and uh, request it. So that's that was in Sweden. Um, in the United States, uh, what happened was there was a feminist women's health center, a collective in Oakland. And um, of course, in California. Of course, in California. <laughs> and at this place, um, there were a number of women who were coming to the um, uh, uh, assisted. They wanted to know the class was about how to avoid conception. But these people were coming to the class not to avoid conception, but they wanted to learn about how to actually conceive. 
And I know that sounds crazy, uh, but what I mean by that is conceive with the assistance of an outsider. Mm -hmm. And when it became clear that there were a number of people who actually um, wanted to conceive, in their cases, most of the time it was with a known donor, mm -hmm. a friend, um, um, perhaps uh, the brother of one's partner. Mm -hmm. These are called known donors. Mm -hmm. Um, they realized that um, people were using these classes as conception classes. From that, what happened was um, there were health scares, there was the rise of HIV, of um, and they realized that they needed to be screening donors. And from this, there were sperm banks that were in existence at the time with anonymous donors, but the problem was the only people that they'd be willing to assist were heterosexual couples. The women, yeah, the women who were coming to this health collective were um, typically uh, same-sex female mm -hmm. couples mm -hmm. or single women. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, who uh, requests the most this type of uh, conception? Yes. Well, uh, speaking about heterosexual uh, couples, I know some countries in the world, and I can think of Italy, for example, mm -hmm. they don't allow artificial insemination or donor uh, sperm donor insemination um, to single women yeah. and same-sex uh, lesbian couples. So that's interesting. So that leads me to be asking you, um, does California, well, of course, California has some laws mm -hmm. restrictions and regulations about this. Without going into details, mm -hmm. what do you think stands out for you in terms of which would benefit both the donor and the beneficiary mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the law. So in California, there's something called the, the Uniform Parentage Act. It, fun, it falls under family law. And the law is such that um, if a man provides sperm mm -hmm. under the direction of a physician, a mm -hmm. medical provider, mm -hmm. then the sperm that he provides, provided it's, it's to a person to whom he's not um, intending to provide it to, yes. a partner, yes. a spouse, yes. a friend, provided he's um, providing it such as to a sperm bank, mm -hmm. then he has no parental responsibilities or parental rights. Those rights and responsibilities go to the intended parents. I understand. So that law has actually been in place for many years. Mm -hmm. And what about anonymity? Do they have... Uh there's no, it's a voluntary? It's a voluntary thing. So, uh, so sperm banks um, for a long time have typically re recruited anonymous donors. Yes. Again, mm -hmm. presumably never to be known by the intended parents or the individuals who had been conceived this way. That's right. Um, as I was saying, in the 1980s, this Feminist Women's Health Collective, um, what evolved from that was a sperm bank. Mm -hmm. And it was a non, it continues to be a non-profit sperm bank. And at the sperm bank, um, the majority of users at the time were lesbian couples and single women. Mm -hmm. But do note, there were heterosexual couples too. But the um, lesbian couples and single women were coming at forming their families from a very different perspective than heter heterosexual couples. The heterosexual couples, it had al always been framed as sperm donation is a medical technique that's going to help you have a family and you can just go away and forget about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. and, and there were reasons for doing that. There was concern about stigma for the mm -hmm, family. There mm -hmm. was concern at that time that mm -hmm. the, the, there might be difficulties with attachment between the father and the child. There was the stigma associated with male infertility. Mm -hmm. So the good news is that things have evolved considerably from, from that perspective. That's very good news. Um, and, and the psychologists. And the psychologists, yes. Uh, these donors mm -hmm. in California, or specifically at the Sperm Bank of South California, A, do they have to be um, screened yes. for diseases? Oh, yes. All right. So that's good. And the Sperm yeah. Bank itself does that? Yes. With the assistance of the medical staff and all right, that. Right, right. And the number two is, um, are they paid? Yes. I see. So typically uh, in the United States, and actually um, I was doing a review of programs internationally, and at almost all programs, donors are paid. Mm -hmm. It's seen as a, as a balance between um, an mm -hmm. altruistic act mm -hmm. and recognition that to be a sperm donor, you have to commit to at least seven or eight months. Yes. If you're an open identity donor, you yes. commit to, uh, to your life. 
and for being life. exposed to um, That's right. having some kind of responsibility. Uh, now, um, let's talk about the donors themselves. Mm -hmm. Do they want to know? Do they have to sign a paper? Say, I well, you said before they waive all responsibilities mm -hmm. and everything. But suppose a donor later on in life would like to know whom he gave the sperm to. Mm -hmm. Have can, you can encountered he access that, that yes. information? That's an amazing question. Um, so there's Good. two answers. <laughs> that is two answers Let's to that question. Let's see your amazing response. <laughs> the two answers to the yeah. question is, um, one is that research is showing that donors are interested, men, not all, no, there's always not. variability, yes. but, but there are donors out there who are curious about what happened um, if there were any children that resulted from their assistance. Yeah. So um, they are curious about the people that they helped conceive. Um, and um, I'm, now I'm thinking specifically of the sperm donors uh, at the Sperm Bank of California. Yes, these of course. Are, these are open identity donors, yes. which means that they agree at the time that they were donors. Um, so of people who would be releasing their identities now, these are from 20 years ago. They, 20 years ago they agreed, yes. I agree that the sperm bank can release my identity to adult offspring if that donor conceived adult comes to the sperm bank and specifically asks for my information. Interesting. Yes. So what happens in that case, so we, so we have a study right now on these donors 10 to 18 years later. And what was amazing to me was that the kinds of questions they had about the donor conceived people were very similar to the kinds of questions that we were hearing from the donor conceived at that time. They were teenagers. Teenagers. And in both sets, um, we were in both sets of groups, they were saying things like, I wonder what these people are like. Yes. I wonder if they're doing, so, so the sperm donors would say yes. things like, I hope they're doing well. I yes. wonder how they are. But the two groups were saying things like, I'm really curious about what happened. I'm curious about what this person is like. I wonder what they look like. Do they look like me? Is there any resemblance? Do they have, um, you know, do they have similar interests? Amazing. Basically, Amazing. the interests are all around like uh, them as uh, a person. Like yeah. what has happened? Yeah. So the very similar. Thank you so much for that clarification. Uh, we don't have very much time left. As I said, fifteen minutes go wow. very quickly, and we could talk for hours. Uh, but. Uh, Specifically, I've been reading about the psychological and social uh, aspects of this, and of course, there are many, I'm sure, uh, many factors, depends on the family and depends right. on the child and all that. But when would you say, from reading the literature mm -hmm. and everything, when is the best time or one of the better times to tell a child ah. that he's been artificially inseminated? Um, uh, the literature suggests uh, that the best time to tell your child that they have a donor or that the family has a donor. That's right. It's a very, you have to be focused on family building. Yes. Um, is to tell them when they're young mm -hmm. and um, so that it's always a part of who they are, that they understand that. It's very much like adoption where mm -hmm. you, you mm -hmm. want to incorporate that in, into the family story. So the yes. family has a donor. This is how we came about um, being a family. This person assisted us. Um, and you can, you can tell your children from the time that they're born. Um, on the other hand, because the, it's not always been that way, the recommendations have not always been you know, tell from the beginning, there's some really great resources that are available out yes. there. Um, and I can think of one set um, that are age-based, so young children, but probably for some parents, the most critical groups are, you know, eight to 11 years old and then teenagers mm -hmm. and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. They have specific guidelines and assistance for how to talk to your child. Oh, that's child. fantastic. And that's from the much UK. Much needed, it's yes. much needed. Yes. Um, that was the Donor Conception Network. This is fascinating, uh, Joanna. Now, this, uh, we, we need to wrap up, as I said, but very briefly, um, this study is, uh, you've been at it for 10 years now. <laughs> are you continuing or are you studying 
other aspect of, of this uh, research? Well, we looked at you know who gets their donor's identity over a 10-year period. Yes. And now what we're doing is we're interviewing, we've actually finished the interviews with the donor-conceived adults who obtain their donor's identity to see what happens. Yes. Um, and that's forthcoming. Wonderful. Joanna Shep, Associate and Adjunct Professor of Psychology, UC Davis, Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, thank you all for watching. And if you'd like to see this uh, episode again, you can go on our website, dctv.davismedia.org. And of course, we will be on YouTube as well. Thank you again. Thank you, Joanna. And uh, see you next time.